The earliest rock cut shrines in India took us into the heart of the mountain. In the deep and dark interior was a symbol of enlightenment. In other shrines was made a mark or linga, which represented the formless one. Leaving behind the cares and confusions of the material world, the seeker was to meditate upon these and to be born again in realization of the oneness of creation. In time, simple structural shrines came to be made. On the walls around the Garbhagreha or womb chamber were made representations of the formless divine in ways that the worshipper could relate to. The texts of the Puranas were compiled in their present form in the first half of the first millennium AD. These created a large pantheon of deities. Families were created where the deity was accorded a spouse and children who were also worshipped as divine. Stories were woven around them which explained and brought alive ethical concepts of life in the world and the victory of knowledge over confusion. The Dravidian or South Indian style of structural temples was established by the 8th century in temples at Mamallapuram and Kanchipuram. Above the shrine is a storied pyramidical tower pillared mandapas or halls came to be added to the temple to accommodate worshippers. The position of wall niches with deities, their orientation and other details were set out in the texts called the Agmas. By the time of the Cholas in Tamil Nadu, the temple walls became repositories of the pantheon of deities. The grand Brihadishwara temples at Tanjavur and at Gangai Konda Cholapuram, made in the 11th century, marked the height of the development of temples under the Cholas. Besides the tower and the mandapa, high gopuras or entrance gateways were also added to the temples. These were to become the models for the impressive temples of South India, which were to follow in later centuries. In this time, the role of the temple was also expanded to make it a major cultural and social institution. Inscriptions at the Tanjavur temple record innumerable grants and gifts which were made to the temple. Arrangements were made and housing colonies were created to accommodate the 400 dancers, musicians and others who were employed for the daily temple ceremonies. Naturally, the architecture of the temple grew in keeping with its expanding role in the life of the community. Further developments of the temple complex occurred under the Vijayanagara kings who ruled from their capital at Hampi in present-day Karnataka. In the 16th century, monumental temples were constructed under them in a style which became characteristic of Vijayanagara. Imposing gateway towers, which were much taller than those above the shrines, were made. These were visible from afar and reflected imperial magnificence as well as the grandeur of the divine. It was through these portals that the worshipper entered the exalted world of the spirit,
leaving the mundane behind. Horizontally too, the temple complex expanded to accommodate larger numbers of people. Large and elaborate pillared halls with impressive sculptures reflected the power of the kingdom. The Shiva temple at Chidambaram is where the Lord is believed to have performed his cosmic dance as Nataraja. It is one of the most revered temples of Tamil Nadu. The great Tamil saints, whose hymns comprise the Tevaram, write of their raptures upon seeing the dance of Shiva here. The earliest parts of the temple belong to Chola times. The Cholas made the Nataraja their family deity and several kings had their coronations here. Under the Cholas, the roof of the sanctum was gilded. A mural of the beginning of the 11th century at the Brihadishvara temple at Tanjavur shows the golden canopy of the Chidambaram temple. The temple houses the most sacred of all Shiva lingas in Tamil Nadu, the Akash linga. This is formless, an empty space in the sanctum. It is believed to best embody the wisdom of the Upanishads. Between the 12th and 16th centuries, the modest-sized temple was extended to cover 40 acres of land. The inner four goparas would have been made in the 13th century. The outer walls and gateways were added in the last phase of the expansion in the 16th century. Since ancient times, the purpose of philosophic thought in India was to provide a path towards knowledge, towards a personal experience of the fact of the oneness of all of creation. The aim was to lose the ego and the perception of oneself and one's importance as a separate entity. There were no depictions of kings who patronized the shrines and the art, for personalities were only ephemeral. With the passage of time, there was a change of emphasis. The grandeur of rulers began to be displayed, along with the glory of the Lord, at great temples. Even portraits of kings began to be seen in the art from the 8th century onwards. Here at the Chidambaram temple, the motivation for the expansion was to transform the sacred but small shrine into a vast and impressive temple, one that would convey the majesty of the Lord and of the kings who built it. The formless divine enshrined deep inside was now also made visible from far away. The grandeur of temples was further enhanced under the Nayakas by the making of prakaras or enclosed corridors. These connect various parts of the temple and create a most dramatic and impressive effect as the devotee walks through these on way to worship. The most famous of these is at the Shiva temple at Rameshwaram. The temple has approximately one kilometer of corridors whose breadths range from five to six meters. The roofs are more than seven meters high. Each of the several hundreds of pillars is elaborately sculpted.
One of the greatest achievements of the Nayaka period is the making of the Minakshi Temple at Madurai. It is one of the largest temples ever made and was created in the reign of Tirumalai Nayaka in the mid 17th century. The complex is built around two shrines, one dedicated to Shiva as Sundareshwara, the beautiful Lord, and the other to his spouse Parvati as Minakshi, the fish-eyed one. The vast temple has eight impressive gateways, one rising to almost 200 feet. These are each covered with several hundreds of sculptures. Temple authorities estimate that there are 33 million sculptures in the Minakshi complex. Even if that number is not based upon an actual count, the temple does convey such an impression. By the end of the first millennium, a significant change had come into the worship at South Indian temples. The final grace was still to be discovered in the dark interior of the Garbhagriha or womb chamber. However, the deity had also been given forms in bronze images. These came out of the shrine and even out of the temple complex to grant darshan to the people. Darshan or the bestowal of grace through the act of looking upon the divine is one of the earliest continuing concepts in all Indic philosophies. Recognition of the divine which pervades all that there is around us, awakens the divinity within us. The bronze images were taken out of their shrines in procession, both as a part of daily rituals and to celebrate festivals. This made the deities much more accessible and created a more direct contact with devotees. These were deities made in the image of the people themselves, with spouses and children, which made possible a very personal devotion to the divine. Temple architecture was expanded to serve the needs of these festivities, for which large number of worshippers gathered. Every evening at the Madurai temple, the deity Minakshi is placed in a bedchamber for the night. The Lord, symbolized by the image of his feet, is then carried to her. In the morning, they will be awakened by the singing of devotional songs. In the Nayaka period, large tanks were also made within the temple complexes for the ritual cleansing of the devotees. We see here at the Minakshi temple how after their evening prayers people spend time relaxing within the temple compound. Indeed, besides being places to meditate and to gain knowledge, the temple had grown to accommodate all aspects of life. Thereby, the temple also serves to remind us of the divinity which pervades all moments of our existence. Spectacular halls with numerous sculpted pillars were made in the Nayaka period. This 16th century hall of a thousand pillars has almost exactly that number of massive sculpted columns. Carved out of a large slab of granite, each pillar is a monumental work of art. All the different animals 
these fantastic vialas or yalis that line the corridors of South Indian temples, these huge beasts with, um, with lion-like bodies, with elephant-like snouts, with claws, with fierce eyes, eyes. They are ferocious beasts, but they are not, uh, they may be frightening, but they are also reassuring because they are keeping away evil and negative spirits. They are things reassuring the worshipper as he progresses or she progresses into the sanctuary that only good things will happen once they reach the sanctuary. And sculpture, I think, performs this function of reassuring and protecting the worshipper as they do the major deity. Once in 12 years, the temple is re-consecrated to maintain its sacred nature. At that time, the thousands of sculptures and the great gopuras are repaired, repainted, and even replaced. It is a living and evolving tradition till today. Perhaps the greatest example of the temple as the focus of life in South India is the Vishnu temple at Sri Rangam in the delta of the river Kaveri. There was a temple here in the 7th or 8th century. The 12 Vaishnava saints, the Alvars, sang more in praise of this temple than of any other. The present structures date from its reconstruction in 1371 onwards. The temple reached its final shape in the 17th century when Sri Rangam became a capital of the Naikas. In 1987, the southern Gopara, which was unfinished, was completed by a wealthy family. Today it stands 236 feet tall, an example of the continuing religious culture of Tamil Nadu. The temple complex measures 878 meters by 755 meters and is the largest in India. It has 21 gopuras, not all of which were completed. The temple has seven walled enclosures, which surround the sacred shrine. From the time of the early stupas, a boundary wall was made. This separated the mundane world outside from the ordered space within. The concentric arrangement of walls around the sacred center is a mandala, which expresses the essential structure of the world we live in. From the innermost point, where the divine is seen as all pervasive, he expands outwards in his many manifestations in the world of forms. All that there is, in our lives and the world around, is seen as emanating from the still center of the cosmos. We are able to see here the sacred structure and the essential meaning of all of existence. Temple processions which regularly take place in all of South India express the radiating presence of the deity. They confirm, in ritual terms, the essential unity of the sacred space with the urban space around. The architecture and layout of the town is made accordingly, emanating from its center at the temple. The temple has many magnificent pillared halls. A hall near the east gate of the fourth enclosure 
has impressive carvings of rampant horses with riders. These are made on a grand scale and continue a theme which had become popular under the Vijayanagara rulers. Here the sculpture, of course, is subservient to these enormous spatial architectural settings and these great mandapas, these great pillared halls with columns carved as animals and figures become the major experience. And here the focus is not so much on a single icon um, which is embedded in a sort of wall, but icons that seem to jump into our space. They seem to come out of the columns to inhabit the space that the devotee is walking and progressing through. So the concern here is perhaps not to create an otherworldly, but rather to create the reverse. The emphasis in this period has shifted away from the importance of individual sculptures. Earlier, the temples were much smaller structures. The sculptures were most important. It was a very personal contact with the divine. The devotee was to be moved and transported through his response to the beauty and grace of the art. In this period, it is the architecture which in its size and magnificence reminds the devotee of the grandeur of the divine. Sculptures are often repetitive and act as decorations of the grand structures. In the great temple cities of South India, the revealed space has expanded to clearly display the sacred nature of the universe. The search is still for the peace which can only be found within. However, the grandeur of the Lord is celebrated in all aspects of life. Thank you.